Myasthenia gravis is the most common disorder of neuromuscular transmission. It is an autoimmune disorder characterized by variable weakness involving the eyes, ocular, bulba, to do with speech and swallowing, the limbs, and the respiratory muscles. The classic presentation is a fluctuating weakness that is more prominent in the afternoon. The autoimmune attack occurs at the communication between the motor nerve and skeletal muscles. This area is called the neuromuscular junction. The end of the motor nerve is the terminal bulb, which houses vesicles containing acetylcholine, ACH. Normally, when an action potential arrives at the terminal, the influx of sodium ions through voltage-gated sodium channels causes depolarization and opens voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium influx triggers the release of acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter which binds onto acetylcholine receptors on the muscle fibers. This causes an influx of sodium ions into the muscle which eventually causes muscle contraction. Once muscle contraction occurs, acetylcholine is broken down into acetyl-CoA and choline which gets recycled to make more acetylcholine for the nerve. The cycle continues. There is another important receptor called the musk receptor, which stimulates the expression of acetylcholine receptor. So when you have more acetylcholine receptor, this allows for more acetylcholine binding and therefore, uh, you know, muscle contraction. Myasthenia gravis is an acquired autoimmune disorder of the neuromuscular junction characterized by weakness and fatigability of skeletal muscles. The exact etiology is unclear, but one theory is an association with hyperplastic thymus or a thymoma, which is a tumor from the thymus gland. Autoimmunity occurs here at the T-cell and B-cell co-stimulation, which results in the development of antibodies against acetylcholine receptors, the ACHR. Acetylcholine receptor antibodies are the most common antibodies found in Myasthenia gravis, and it's associated with the thymoma we mentioned, and have a strong ocular involvement, which we will talk about. The antibodies bind to the acetylcholine receptor and causes an antibody-mediated complement attack. The complement attack means that they will activate complement protein, a series of proteins important in triggering and promoting the immune response. So the complement activation and the immune attack will reduce the number of acetylcholine receptors. And the destruction of the acetylcholine receptors over time will lead to muscle fatigability and weakness. Myasthenia gravis can also be caused by certain medications. Penicillamine induces the production of acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Other medication causing myasthenia gravis, which has been found, include chlor um, chloroquine, which is an antiparasitic agent, and quinidine, an antiarrhythmic. Some patients with myasthenia gravis who are seronegative for acetylcholine receptor antibodies, meaning that they don't have acetylcholine receptor antibodies, they have antibodies directed against another target on the surface of the muscle membrane. This is the muscle-specific receptor tyrosine kinase, or MUSC for short, which we mentioned. Now, MUSC receptor antibodies will attack the MUSC receptor and therefore reduce acetyl choline receptor um, expression. Musk receptor antibodies have no thymoma association and are common in females and bulbar and ocular involvement is common. Clinical features of myasthenia gravis 
Clinically, myasthenia gravis can be divided into three types. Ocular myasthenia gravis, which only involves the eyes. Generalized myasthenia gravis, which is more predominantly the limbs, so weak arms and feet and legs, or an overlap between the two. Features of ocular myasthenia gravis include ptosis and diplopia from the ocular muscles being affected. Myasthenia gravis may also be, remember, associated with thymomas, particularly if they have acetylcholine receptor positive antibodies. Patients often present with proximal muscle weakness, which is fatigable. This is more so for generalized myasthenia gravis. And then you have also respiratory muscle weakness, bulbar involvement, which causes weakness of the muscles in the throat, leading to dysarthria, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, and fatigability. Importantly, myasthenia crisis is a medical emergency characterized by severe weakness involving bulbar and respiratory muscles requiring intubation or non-invasive ventilation. Because myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease, there is an association with other autoimmune diseases, including thyroid disease, Schrogan syndrome, and systemic lupus erythematosus. Most clinicians feel that there are three stages to the disease that is myasthenia gravis. There is an active phase with the most fluctuations and the most severe symptoms that occurs in the five to seven years after onset. Most myasthenia crisis occurs in this early period. This is typically followed by a more stable second phase, and in this phase, the symptoms are stable but persists. They may worsen in the setting of infection, medication tapering, or a surgery. In many patients, though, this is followed by the third phase, in which remission may occur, with the patients free of symptoms of any therapy or even off medications entirely. So what are the investigations to order when someone has suspected myasthenia gravis? There's this thing called the ice pack test. Basically, the test is based on the physiological uh, principle that neuromuscular transmission improves at lower muscle temperatures. And so placing ice over the eye for five minutes improves the ptosis temporarily. There's a test called the endrophonium test, also known as the tensulon test. Uh, this is used to diagnose myasthenia gravis before acetylcholine receptor antibody test became the common method. The endrophonium is a short-acting acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, so symptoms improve rapidly after the administration of this drug. EMG is also very important, which assesses basically the muscles and the nerves. So with repeated stimulation of the nerve, it will produce a, a decrementing uh, amplitude because the muscle becomes fatigable. There are serological tests to order. So the first most important one is the presence of acetylcholine receptor antibodies, which is seen in 85% of cases of patients with myasthenia gravis. This is usually associated with ocular, generalized, or overlap myasthenia gravis with varying severity. There is also musk antibodies, which is present in 8% of cases of myasthenia gravis. Musk is often associated more so with generalized myasthenia gravis. There's presence of also the LRP4 antibody, which is only found in 1%, and this is usually associated with mild symptoms. There's also seronegative myasthenia gravis, which is surprisingly more, uh, quite common, 6% of cases. It's really similar presentation to someone with seropositive myasthenia gravis. However, more likely to have purely ocular disease, so eye disease, ptosis and whatnot, and tend to have better response to treatment and outcome. It's worth noting a condition that is a good differential for myasthenia gravis, which is Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. And I will have a, a separate video on this that we'll talk about in more detail. Speaking of differential diagnosis of myasthenia, 
Again, Lambert Eaton syndrome. Uh, some fun facts. It is a paraneoplastic syndrome characterized by presynaptic antibodies against voltage gated calcium channels. Botulism, which is caused by Clostrid Clostridium uh, botulinum, which produces a toxin that inhibits presynaptic acetylcholine release and therefore weakness. Medications, specifically aminoglycosides, may interfere with acetylcholine transport across the neuromuscular junction. Another differential is Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an acute autoimmune disease causing demyelination of predominantly motor neurons. Motor neuron disease is another differential. It is a degenerative neurological condition affecting both lower and upper motor neurons, resulting in muscle weakness. The differential diagnosis of Mycenae gravis uh, specifically only involving the eyes, so ocular myasthenia, include Miller-Fisher variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome, thyroid ophthalmopathy, even diabetes ophthalmopathy, as well as brainstem and motor cranial nerve lesions. Management of myasthenia gravis. So first and foremost is awareness of medications with, uh, which may potentiate or worsen the symptoms of myasthenia gravis. There is a role of thymectomy, which is specifically if someone has myasthenia gravis with uh, acetylcholine receptor positive antibodies. Immunosuppressive agents are very important in the management of myasthenia gravis. And really, the main goal of immunosuppressive agents is to reduce the immune system because fundamentally it is an immune disease. It's an autoimmune disease. And so the most common one is steroids, which uh, it suppresses the lymphocytes through of different mechanisms and is used especially during periods of exacerbations of myasthenia. Other immunosuppressive agents include cyclosporin, an interleukin-2 inhibitor, which targets T cells, and azathioprine, which targets both B and T cells. For myasthenia gravis with bulba involvement, myasthenic crisis, or when someone does not respond to those immunosuppressive agents I mentioned earlier, agents such as intravenous immunoglobulins can be used, which aims to normalize the immune system and plasmapheresis, which aims to remove the plasma containing the antibodies and then replacing this. However, it's probably the most important one, first line in someone who has symptoms of myasthenia gravis is acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, such as oral pyrostigmine, which really aims to keep acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction so that it can promote contraction. In summary, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder characterized by generalized weakness and fatigability worse in the afternoon. There are presence of antibodies against acetylcholine receptor. It may be ocular involvement, generalized involvement, or an overlap syndrome. First line treatment is pyrostigmine, and then other immunosuppressive agents and thymectomy may be warranted.